Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out. I have a bit of a show and tell for you. I get to show you a little bit about my artwork and really about my, my creative process. So this will be a bit of an insight into my creative process as it is currently. Because, of course, as you know, creative processes are dynamic things and they change a lot. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the, a lot to say. My challenge here is to try not to say too much uh, and let the images speak for themselves as much as I can and to try to stay somewhat focused. Um, I'm going to start with um, some examples of what my art has been like, the stuff, the kind of artwork I've been doing throughout uh, the past 10 or 15 years. Um, which has been a lot of fun for me, but it started to get a little boring. Um, I've been really into pen and ink work because it travels easily. I've done a lot of backpacking and walking around all over the country, and um, I found that my easel and my paints just were too heavy, they didn't fit in my backpack, and it was time to, to slim things down. So I got into a lot of black and white work. This is a pen and ink drawing. As you'll notice, uh, my inspiration comes from the living landscape. I'm in love with nature. I find a lot of inspiration in these places that, um, that I find really sacred and special. And the other thing um, that is interesting to, or I think that, it, that is of interest, is that um, my artwork is also informed by my lifestyle, which I think is true with a lot of art, most artists. And what I've been doing to make money for the past 15 and 16 years is teaching people about wilderness skills. So as a profession, I'm a wilderness survival instructor. And so that also features in my work, trying to share that kind of human heritage, bringing that to the modern world. So you can see there's kind of a, a that was kind of stuck in a certain way of doing things. And then so a lot of things happened. I started experimenting. I got, well, I got bored with my work. And I started experimenting and deciding that it would be fun to, to see if I could make my own materials from the landscape. Kind of doing like a, oh no, I'm in a survival situation. I need to make this artwork. <laughs> what do I do? Except, of course, that would be ridiculous. Um, but even still, I was interested to see what I could do without plastic or metal or glass. And just what could I procure from the landscape in the, way, the same ways that I've been approaching shelter, water, fire, and food. Um, and that led, eventually it led to a book that I was fortunate enough to, um, to be able to write and illustrate. And that's the little plug for the book. And this is kind of where this whole rabbit hole opened wide, wide open for me. And I started looking back into ancient artwork and trying to find the earliest examples of, of two-dimensional drawings and paintings. And I was really inspired by the cave art in, in France, southern France, Chauvet Cave in uh, particular. I found really incredible. Just the charcoal drawings, it's ancient, ancient mediums, you know, charcoal and stone pigments rendered exquisitely on, on cave walls, just protected for 35,000 years, still gives me the chills. And so that, that particular <clears throat> glimpse into our past really inspired me to look at charcoal a lot closer. And it's such an ancient, simple medium and I'm kind of in love with it all over again. And so I started making charcoal from willow twigs and grapevine and basically anything woody. <laughs> I'll make charcoal with it and try it out. So this is just a, some examples of some of the charcoal sticks I've been playing with and making. You know, I'll harvest the, the willow twig or whatever the, the species is and take the bark off, load it up into a cookie tin, just like our ancestors did. <laughs> a joke. I'm sure they ate cookies, or they would have. They could have. Um, and, you know, seal it up really nice, poke a little hole in it, and then burn it. Make a really big conflagration, which is always fun. And then when you let it cool down, you, we have this amazing product. This, the, you know, you get to see this really primal transformation occur, where this, what used to be wood is, is now something totally different. It's just the pure elemental carbon, and it has this metallic ceramic kind of ting when you drop it and they clink together, and it's this really fun transformation. And for me, a lot of this is a theme in what my work and the, pro, the creative process that I'm exploring is really the joy of transformation. 
and it's kind of fun to be a, a catalyst of that transformation. Um, I like to be a participant in what's going on. So. And these are little charcoal holders, because as you know, if you work with charcoal, it, just, it shrinks really quickly, and you're left with a little nub. And what do you do with those nubs? Well, you stick them in the end of a stick, and then you, you, gotta, you can work with it a little longer. And, um, and those are really simple, fun things to make from all sorts of woody things that you might find on the landscape. This is uh, me using a piece of charcoal that I made from wild grape grapevine, and I felt compelled to represent the wild grape in the work. I like drawing pretty ladies. This is my girlfriend. What really is exciting to me, um, perhaps more than other mediums, is pen and ink. As you could see from my earlier work, I was really focused on that. And when I realized that I might be able to make my own inks and then figure out different things to improvise as pens, it pretty much cracked my whole world open in a good way. So this is an, an image of me experimenting with a sharpened oak twig. There's nothing special about this at all. And I'm using ink that I made from acorns from the oak as well, from that same, same tree, actually, same individual tree. Um, and so, you know, it's basically using a stick as a combination between a paintbrush and a pen. And it's, just, it's a dip pen. Probably one of the simplest versions of that. Um, and then turkey quills. You know, I had to I had to really look at, at feathers for a pen making material, which are my favorite. I I would say at this point. So this is me working on a, a drawing of a wild turkey with a pen that I made from a wild turkey's feather. I decided that I needed a reservoir for my pens because I was tired of dipping all the time. And I wanted, I wanted a nice ink charge to last as long as I could. So uh, I knew that traditional ink reservoirs and dip pens were made from brass. But I pretty much gave myself the limitations of no metal, no glass, no plastic. And so I discovered that birch bark makes a really wonderful reservoir. And that's me inserting it into a pen and nice finished turkey quill pen with an ink reservoir made from birch bark. And I just, I find the materials themselves to be rather beautiful too. And so that's part of the fun. And these are some pens made from bamboo with various design features. Some of them, this one here is a scroll pen, has four, four nib points. And the thing that I've, I was surprised to learn was that each of these pens has a different personality and a different kind of working characteristics. And at first, I was very skeptical. Why would I want to use a stick for, as, you know, as a paintbrush, essentially? You know? But once I started playing with them, I realized that it's, a, it's an entirely different creature than a modern pen. Modern pens are wonderful. They have very consistent line quality, very consistent uh, opacity with their ink, um, which can be very you know, favorable. And uh, something that I had been leaning on and depending on with my artwork. And then when I started making my own pens, I realized, wow, there is it's like an infinite spectrum of creative potential with these things. Because one ink charge is going to give you fresh ink from the beginning. And then as it's running out of ink, you have this, you're running through a whole grayscale from black to white almost. And you can use those, you know, you can kind of gauge where your ink is at as your pen is running out of its charge and use that intentionally in your artwork. I also figured out how to make interchangeable nibs by making a, basically a little vise on a pen, these little clamp pens, I call them, where you can take the wedge out and um, insert different kinds of nibs. I, some of these I put leather, little buckskin pieces, so it's kind of like a felt tip pen, like a little primitive marker. So that's an example of, of the what if thought experiment that I like to live in my mind with. You know, what if, is it possible, could our Stone Age ancestors have you know, figured out how to use primitive Sharpie markers? I don't know, there's no evidence that they did, but they certainly could have, because I did it with Stone, Stone Age technology, <laughs> right? So just some more fun compositions of the pens. This is just an ash twig from a white ash tree. And it works great. 
So using a bamboo pen to draw bamboo. So this has been a theme. I like to try to honor the source material in the subject matter as I'm working. There's that turkey drawing. The ink, by the way, this, this ink that I used for this piece in the previous, I made from the soot of pine trees. Uh, and I'll get into that really soon. Um, so there's the pen part. Now we're getting into the inks. This is just kind of a fun self. This is a selfie. Yeah. <laughs> and the, you know, just playing with a variety of inks that I was working with. So um, all those colors are from, a lot of them are from berries. A lot of them are from, you know, nuts, soot, <laughs> all sorts of things. So one of my favorite inks is, is um, tannic acid based ink. So uh, tannic acid is really common in the plant world. Trees use it in their, their bodies and their bark to protect them from fungal invasion. So it's a very common substance in the natural world. Um, acorns happen to be loaded with it. So I decided I would try using acorns as an ink source. So here I am crushing up some acorns in my mortar and pestle making a really strong tea with it, straining it, and then adding a binder. In this case, I was using hide glue that I made from deer hides. Uh, you can use honey, you can use a lot of different things for your binder. I was particularly interested in the hide glue, which is basically jello, gelatin. You might not ever eat jello again, but. Um, <laughs> And then this is my, what I call my, my pet rust or my rust farm, where I, um, you know, I gathered up little rusty or rust prone nuts and bolts and things and gathered it in a jar and covered it over with vinegar to let it oxidize and get this nice iron vinegar solution in which then I add that to my tannic acid mixture and it, this really cool chemical reaction occurs where it turns black or blackish. In this case with the acorn ink it turned kind of a nice warm purple black. So this is a pine stump from an old white pine tree where the tree had been cut down long enough ago that the wood was all pretty much dry rot, punky, you could break it apart with your hands, except where the branch whorls were. Right? The, where the branch whorls are, it's, the wood is full of resin and therefore it's the only part that is really hard still when the trees are at this stage of decomposition. That's what I was going for, because they're saturated with all that pine resin. So what am I doing with that? This is another kind of ink that I'm making. And my personal favorite kind of ink is made from soot. And so pine soot ink, you, I've gathered up, you gather up those knots from the rotten stumps and split them up with my hatchet, make a little fire. And I devised a, a contraption to collect soot from an old sap bucket. I cut the bottom off of a metal sap bucket, so it's just a cylinder. And I put a tractor, a metal tractor funnel on it. So it kind of looks like the Tin Man from Wizard of Oz. And inside is, is that little smoky, resinous, sooty fire. And as it burns, it's just quick, hot fire. And a lot of, the, a lot of smoke is, it comes out. I'll have to figure out how to, how to collect all the smoke. But in the meantime, this is what I come up with. When the fire burns out, then I can invert the funnel and sweep all this soot that is condensed on the inside into a jar, right? And so this is precious, precious material. <laughs> it's so precious. Because one of the things that, that I've learned through making my own inks is the finer you can grind your pigment source, in this case the pigment is soot, uh, then the higher the quality of the ink is. And so um, before I was making soot inks, I was, making, I was grinding charcoal into the finest particulates I could get, which could still never be as fine as the soot. Right, so I sweep the soot into the jar, pour it into a ceramic mortar and pestle, Add some water and some hide glue. Again, you can do this with honey. You can do it with eggs. You can do it with all sorts of things. And then you grind. And you grind. And you keep grinding. And you might watch a few movies. <laughs> well, what is there to grind at that point? Is well, it just powder? Well, here's the thing. It's just powder, but 
it's, it's carbon. It's this pure form of carbon that I discovered was hydrophobic. They do not, the carbon does not want to mix with, with the liquids at all. And so the grinding is it's less about making the particulates smaller and more about mixing them together. And it takes about 20 to 30 hours of grinding. Uh, I've got away with you know, lower quality inks at 10 to 15 hours, but this gave me a lot of appreciation of the Chinese spiritual traditions that have evolved over time around the ink grinding process, the paper making, even the use of the ink, the sacred scrolls, which I know very little about, but I have, I have some direct insight as to why that may have become sacred. <laughs> um, and, you know, for me, I would just grind, it would be something I would come to and work on a little bit every day. I would have conversations with my sweetie while grinding ink. I would, um, you know, audiobooks and movies, phone conversations. So less of a meditation, but still something. And the final product, this precious batch of ink, soot-based ink in a jar. And this is essentially India ink. This is um, a, one of many variations on the ancient so-called India ink or Chinese ink. The things that make one batch different from the other are the essential oils that they're, they were adding in to, for aroma, you know, the, the experience of using the ink. You know, every family ink making dynasty would have their own secret recipes. Um, this was mine. <laughs> Something that has been really fun is using it for, for washes, painting with the ink. All right, so this is a painting I did with that same ink. And she's, she's hugging a white pine tree, which I thought deserved some love for giving me the soot. Here's some black walnuts, which are a pretty well-known source of beautiful brown pigments for making ink. And essentially, I process those the same way that I do the acorns, get a nice brown. And then there's all these other things you can make ink with. I got really into making ink from different berries even though I knew they were very ephemeral and the colors were fugitive and they weren't going to be light fast. Um, that didn't slow me down. I still had a lot of fun working with them and documenting them while they were vibrant and watching them as they fade. So this, this, the original of this is now pretty much brown. Right? So th these are elderberries. This is a study that I made with elderberry ink. Um, this is the one I came up with afterwards. I think I kind of like the study better. <laughs> Playing with blackberries for making ink. Coffee, why not? Brew a strong batch of coffee, drink some, and use some for ink. This is a beet that I boiled uh, and I reduced. It was actually several beets that I reduced in uh, a very strong decoction and came up with a really nice brown ink. Making pens, making inks, now you need something to put the inks in. Because dryers are cool and they work really well, but I wanted to see what I could come up with. So I started playing with clay. Well, I've been playing with clay for years and years, but I decided I would start making ink jars with my, with my local pottery. There's something really cool about digging clay from your backyard, forming it into something, and then firing it in your backyard and turning it into pottery. Um, and I've discovered that the smaller the thing that you make, the higher survival rate it has. <laughs> a lot of my big pots, I have like a, a pretty high, high mortality rate with my bigger pot. So this is just a selection of ink wells, little ink jars essentially, and paint dishes that in this photo, they're, pre, they're preheating, getting ready to actually go in the fire. They've been preheating for several hours at this point. And at this point, they're finished preheating and I'm putting them on to their little structure, their little foundation, getting ready to fire. And then they get covered with firewood and then all the coals get raked back in. And then you, you, you stand back and cross your fingers. And most of these ones survived. You can see the one in the left corner didn't. But I was pretty happy with the results of that particular batch. And there's something really fun about digging through the coals and finding these little pots. Ink wells. You know, pottery is one way to make a jar to use to hold your ink. You can carve them out of soapstone. Bamboo doesn't grow here, but 
man, is that a wonderful plant for making things. Um, then bone. I don't have any bone ones in this picture, but here we go. Mm -hmm. um, bone is a fantastic material, totally overlooked in our modern world as a, as a raw material for creating things of our material culture. Plastic has replaced a lot of these things, of course. I could have done it. I could have just used plastic. It probably would have been a lot easier. Almost as cool. <laughs> so bamboo again. I love this stuff. I bring it home with me when I travel. And then there's something really nice about filling one of these things up with your ink and playing with it. Okay. Guess what the next topic is? Paper. Paper. Right. So I, I like to make paper. I find. Obviously, in the theme, as the theme goes, my inspiration comes from the natural world, and I'm amazed by the, the world's first paper makers, which are the paper wasps. This is a photo of some paper cascading out of one of my baskets. <laughs> Let's see, one of these, this one here is from lawn clippings. I, I mowed the lawn one day and I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> look at all this material. So cattail is a wonderful plant for making paper. They tend, they're very abundant where, the, where you find them. The, you, know, you can harvest the, the entire above ground part of the plant and snip it up into little fibers like this to boil and make into a paper pulp. This is a picture of me actually pulling up a sheet. I call it pulling a sheet of paper and then pressing it down and this that's cattail paper. And this is a this is an experimental paper making mold that I use an old picture frame and stretch a piece of burlap over, just to see how how much I can get away with. And here's just some paper curing on the floor. There's something really beautiful about paper. I don't really know what it is, but I, I love it. And these are some of my fancier paper making molds and decals that I, I made just to um, just to come up with a higher quality kind of paper that I can actually do artwork on. And some of the work, actually this piece I have on the wall, the original, and that's made from cattail paper drawn with a pen I made from the cattail stock I'm using the pine soot ink. That was, that was quite a joy to work with that piece of paper. And I had to do a piece with a wasp flying on it wasp ink, or the, <laughs> I have not made ink from wasps yet. Um, the wasp paper with that pine soot ink and a little white stone that I used for chalk that a friend brought back from Italy for me. And bookbinding has been something that has become really fun for me. I use sketchbooks a lot. The sketchbook is a big part of my creative process. A lot of my ideas and thoughts end up getting jotted down and just kind of <laughs> thrown into these sketchbooks. and. It's kind of like an external brain for me. Um, so making them from the landscape has become pretty fun, pretty rewarding. I mean, using bark for the, the, the book covers themselves and getting into that. Played with making my own printmaking supplies a little bit with wood block, especially. These are some brayers that I've kind of improvised from, from Y sticks. Now this one here is from. Uh, an antler from a deer antler. What is the roller material? The roller, the core is a piece of wood and it's wrapped with buckskin. So it works pretty well, actually. It's a really, the trick is making them perfectly cylindrical. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you have to like whittling. At least a whittle. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> My old dog. Paintbrushes. That that becomes a whole other journey. So this this is a picture of me cutting open a turkey feather to use as the ferrule for the paintbrush, where the you know that little piece of the paintbrush that joins the fibers to the handle. Uh, turkey feathers have been used for centuries for this purpose before metal and plastic took over. And you know, with paintbrushes, there's a whole, there's a spectrum of approaches. There's the really, really primitive, like I'm gonna chew the end of this twig and, and I'm gonna paint with it. 
And then there's, I'm lining up individual pieces of fur and whiskers to take advantage of that natural taper of each individual strand, which I'm a, I'm a pretty patient guy, but this drives me crazy. <laughs> it takes me hours to make a single paintbrush. Just the bristle, not just, yeah. And then I'll mess it up and have to start over. So this is a little bit of the process. Yeah, one of these things, I'm like, okay, good. I, I did it, leave it alone. <sighs> that's, that's the hard part. And then the fun part is assembling it, um, putting, putting that bundle of bristles into the ferrule and then sticking it onto the handle. And that's not even using it yet. <laughs> What are these bristles to draw? Oh, that's a great question. Um, this particular one is, is deer fur from white-tailed deer. Um, I use all sorts of fur from different animals. Um, that, you know, roadkill even. Um, this is one of the things that, it's like a, a disclaimer I'd have to share with people if they start getting into this stuff. You might look at roadkill differently. <laughs> you might need to have a conversation with your loved ones about this problem. Or, I mean, this passion. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, fur whiskers, cat whiskers, tend to be really, really great for this. I do not trim whiskers from cats. I have to say that. The last time I did that, I was three. And I haven't done it since. But cats do shed them, and if you're into sweeping and vacuuming, you can find them. I have little, I have my whisker minions collecting them for me. <laughs> so I'll give you my address. Do anyone have cats? <laughs> They're great. So yeah, fur and whiskers are great. And then there's, there's plant fibers. You can use all sorts of things for making paint brushes. This, this is fibers from a palm tree, the bark from coconut palm. This is agave fibers. This upper one you can only see partial, that's wild grape bark. Your fingers, you know, fingers are the original paint brushes. Even pine needles for, you know, kind of quickie field expedient paint brushes. These ones here, I wasn't joking about gnawing twigs. I do that. <laughs> and these are, these are gnawed twigs. And those are some of my favorites, actually. This is one of my paintbrush helpers. <laughs> we have goats at home. This one's name is Paintbrush for some reason. <laughs> some of those paintbrushes are <coughs> good to go for. He, he kind of looked punk rock for a little while, but he got, it, it grew back. This is a... Uh, this is a piece I did with whiskers from my cat. Most of them were from her. A paintbrush I used from whiskers. And that's that pine soda ink again. This is a multimedia piece, a little bit of ink wash and gone over with the pen for some stippling. And now going into paint. So paint is really fun because suddenly rocks become a different kind of resource. So they become a source of color, right? You can, if, if you already had the, the habit of picking up rocks because they're pretty, now you have another reason to do that um, because you can make paint with them. So every, anytime I travel, I'm bringing rocks home. It's kind of a problem, but um, <laughs> it's okay. So these are the pigments that I make from the rocks, which essentially you're grinding them with a stone mortar and pestle, making them as fine as you can, so these are two different samples of pigments from the same exact stone. This is kind of the rough first grind, and then these are purified pigments. Right? And I use water, after I grind them, I use water to purify them. Pour a little bit of water into the jar with the pigments, stir it up. The bigger particulates settle, the lighter, smaller ones will stay in suspension. Those are the ones you want. And here's a picture of me pouring them off into a different jar and then that evaporates, and then I've got that really fine, fine pigment. Once you have pigment, you can make all kinds of paint with it, um, depending on what you're using for a binder. You can add, add egg to make egg tempera. You can add different oils for oil paint. You can add <clears throat> um, hide glue to make some kind of a primitive watercolor. You can use your own saliva, which is what our ancestors were doing in cave walls. A lot of fun things to do with it. Some of the things I'm using to keep my paint in these are little, little <laughs> ceramic ink or paint boxes, and uh, they fit in, inside that 
rawhide box that I'm painting in this picture. Right? That's kind of the finished cover of the box, and here's what's inside. This is one of the paintings I did with those very paints. <laughs> so when you have pigments, you can also make crayons with them. Right? Those same colors you can mix with wax as your binder, pour that into a mold, in this case using Japanese knotweed, which is a vigorous invasive. <laughs> and I figured something, something else to do with it. So they make these really nice kind of perfect forms for these, these crayon molds. And so I've been enjoying using them. So you basically melt your wax and you mix in your pigment. In this, this picture, I'm making a black crayon just with crushed charcoal mixed with the wax. Filling up those, those little molds. And then when they dry, it's like a little Christmas present. You get to open it up and you got a crayon in there. I mean, wee. <laughs> So, and then I discovered that you don't have to open it up, you can kind of use it as a shell. It's like a pencil you can sharpen as well. And I have, there's actually one of the prints on the wall is a, a drawing I made of bees. The actual, an image of the very bees who provided the wax. And this is me working on that piece. And let's see, now we have a, this is, um, <laughs> Bear ink. You know, um, this is uh, just a this is black walnut ink. It's a kind of a multimedia pen and ink wash um, and ink painting. I really like the black walnut ink. This is another piece playing around with stenciling and drawing, kind of another multimedia piece. This is that soot ink again, that black beautiful soot ink. I think I'm wrapping it up here. Oh yeah, that was it. Thanks. I did it. I did it in less than an hour too. <laughs>